Morning, Calvary. My name's Thomas. I'm on staff here at Calvary. It's my joy to be able to teach on Sundays. And today we're going to conclude a four-month study in the book of Revelation. And it's the day before the new year that we're doing this. The phrase is, we're going to spend another year going around the sun. And for everyone in this room, we know what that means, that the earth is traveling around the sun. Now, that's common knowledge for us today, but that is very uncommon for world history to have known. In fact, the earth is spinning at 1,000 miles per hour right now. You are spinning 1,000 miles an hour right now. And the earth is traveling over 64,000 miles per hour as it loops around the sun. Can you feel it? No, you can't. In fact, if I were to describe this to previous generations that did not have this scientific knowledge, they would say, that's not true. And many people evaluate what's true based on what they feel, what they can only observe with their eyes, what is their life experience. And so anything outside of what they feel, what they see, what they have experienced is untrue. But that's not how truth works. Truth is truth, whether you feel it to be true or not. And so we know through instrumentation that we are moving at 1,000 miles per hour. We know from instrumentation that we are moving at 64,000 miles an hour around the sun. And the reason we know that is through scientific discoveries. And a discovery is to discover the reality of life as it has been, as it is, and as it will be. Or if there's any change to anticipate. Another idea of a, another word for scientific discovery would be a scientific revelation. A revelation is to reveal which was otherwise not known apart from an instrument. And like there are scientific revelations to help us understand reality that we do not see or feel or have as our life experience, there's an instrument that gives us a spiritual revelation of the way that the world really is, about the things that we don't necessarily see or feel or think are our life experience. And that instrument that we come and gather around is the Word of God. This is the instrument that helps us understand the reality of life that you and I are in, the ways that things have been, the ways that things are, and the way that things will be. And so you can mock the fact that we're going 1,000 miles an hour, 64,000 miles an hour around the sun, and you would be wrong, and you can mock the reality of what we've been looking at in Revelation, but it's just as true. In fact, more certain than the sun rising tomorrow is that Jesus Christ is coming again. Do you believe that? More certain that the sun comes up tomorrow morning is that Jesus Christ, who came is coming again. And the week that we just lived is the week that really describes our life. We live between the advents, the arrival of Jesus Christ. And so we looked back and we remembered his historical arrival at Christmas. And we look forward to a time in which in history he will come again. And chapter 22 is the blessed hope of his arrival. The book of Revelation has been the unfolding of the activities of Jesus Christ and what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. The opening pages of Revelation is that it's a revelation of Jesus. The whole thing's been about Jesus. It's not primarily about world events, not primarily about the end of history. Though those things are in there, the centerpiece of it all is of Jesus. And if you focus on anything in Revelation... Sequencing, schematics, prophecies that may or may not be in your imagination. You missed the whole point. The whole book was to reveal to you who Jesus is, who he was, is, and is to come. And so let's go to Revelation chapter 22. This is the last page of the Bible. This is great. You have to go to weights and measures next. Chapter 22, 
verse 6. We'll pick it up where we left off. The angel said to me, and he said to me, these words that we have studied for four and a half months, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. This is a revelation to reveal the realities of life that maybe you don't see or feel or think that are happening, which would have otherwise not been known, but that you now know. That you now know these things. It was to open our eyes and our ears and our mind to see the activity of God. And this whole book began with the theme of blessing. Heaven with blessing. And this book ends with blessing. It's blessing to know the book of Revelation. On the very first pages of Revelation, it says to John that this was intended for blessing. Verse 3, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Again, I'm coming soon. Trustworthy are these words, and they are near. And it's a blessing to know this. Now, in the book of Revelation, we've seen that numbers are important. They have meaning behind them. And so the number seven has been the number of perfection, of completion. Do you know how many blessings there are in the book of Revelation? Seven. There are seven blessings in the book of Revelation that talk about the perfected blessing of God to know these things. And the first one is this, that you would hear the blessedness of revelation. That it's, it's, it's a blessing to know the unfolding of what God is up to. You are blessed to have been part of the series of Revelation. If, if this is your first Sunday, I am so glad you're here. You would be blessed to go back where we began and begin to study along with us of the things that God has unfolded. For blessed is the one who reads aloud the words. We have read almost every single word here on Sunday morning. And Blessed is one who hears and who keeps what is written. It's not enough just to, to hear it and to know it, but we want to live it. Blessed is the one who lives out these words. The second blessing is found in Revelation chapter 14. Verse 13, John says, I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. There have been friends in my life, loved ones, that have passed away in 2023. You? Blessed are they who passed in 2023 in the Lord. They're blessed. To have died in Jesus. It says, blessed are they, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. They're, they're at rest right now. They're at peace with the Lord right now. Blessed are that they rest from their labors. And then this, their deeds follow them. What they have done here, as we're going to see, is rewarded with Christ. And so blessed are those that have passed in the Lord this last year, blessed are they who died in the Lord. And in 2024, I'm going to lose more friends and loved ones. And blessed are they who die in the Lord, for they will rest from their labors, and they will be rewarded for what they have done. It is a blessing to live and to die in Jesus. That's the second blessing. The third one here in chapter 16, verse 15 it says, behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. Blessed is the one who anticipates the Lord's coming, who expects the Lord's coming. Blessed is the one who stays awake, for the thief comes and steals and robs while the owner of the house is what? Sleeping. But blessed are you to have known what God is up to in the book of Revelation. And now with the information of what God is going to do, you are awake to the world around you. You're awake to this dragon called Satan, the serpent, the deceiver, who desires to devour the people of God. 
You're awake to the realities of beasts behind governments and economies that seek to devour the people of God. You're awake to the reality of deception in this world that tries to lure you away and entice you away from the goodness that is found in God. Blessed are the ones who know the book of Revelation and are awake to the world around them. Chapter 19, verse 9. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We saw that the eternal life that God has provided for people is not simply he's the master and we're the servants that drudgedly serve him for all eternity, but that he has prepared a marriage supper. Blessed are those that are welcome to the marriage supper, the wedding feast of Jesus Christ who is the groom, to the bride that is the church, that will live in holy matrimony, in the joy and intimacy of marriage for all eternity. That when God thinks of his relationship with you forever, he thinks of it in the intimacy and joy and pleasure of marriage. So blessed are those who are invited, those who have RSVP'd and said, yes, I will be at the marriage supper. I believe in Jesus Christ. Chapter 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. The first resurrection is to be found in Jesus Christ. To those who have said yes to Jesus, who have asked Jesus to forgive them of their sins, they have been buried with him in baptism and have raised to new life. They've been joined with him in resurrection like his. And blessed are those who are raised with Christ for the second death. This is the destruction of all things into the lake of Hades. Is not for them. Blessed are those who share in the first re resurrection over such the second death has no power, John says. So blessed are those who believe in Jesus Christ and have been raised with Christ for the second death. Yes, we'll die with our physical bodies, only to depart from this life to the next, but never in any fear of judgment in the lake of fire. Verse chapter 22 now. We get to 6 and 7. Verse 7, and behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Blessed is the one who keeps them. Just we, we end where we began. Who knows what God has said, who hears what God has said, and then lives it out. Who keeps these words. And then seventh, here in 22, verse 14, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life. And they may enter the city by the gates. We saw that the book of Revelation shows us that God is going to recreate all things new. That in many science fiction novels and movies, they hypothesize about the end of the world. And it's always chaos and violence and destruction. And Revelation shows you that that's not true. Yet it will be chaotic and there will be hardships. The ultimate end is renewal of all things. And the renewal of all things is to restore the Genesis story. God and humanity in the garden and in the middle of the garden was the tree of life. And here the tree of life is in the city that we've seen. And blessed is one who has washed their robes so that they have the right to eat from the tree of life, the world in which God has restored. Now, wash is in the past tense. Like, you have already done this. It's too late at Jesus Christ's return. Blessed are the ones that have already washed. What does that mean? It means they have received the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Revelation already told us about this. This is Revelation chapter 7, verse 13. John sees this vision of these saints coming washed, adorned in white, coming to the throne room of God. It says, then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes and from where have they come? I said to him, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. That's a weird thing. They have washed themselves and have become white from washing in the blood of the lamb. You think if you're washing the blood of the lamb, that would make your robes red. This is a description of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. 
crucified, dead, buried, raised on the third day. And his work, his sacrificial blood, is what washes away our sins. He paid the penalty for our sins, and so his blood is the consequence for our sins. And so those who receive Jesus Christ receive the washing of his forgiveness so that they would be made pure, white as snow. And so here, the seventh one, the the complete blessing is blessed is the one who has received the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. The work of Jesus Christ on the cross that has washed away all their sins. For theirs is the joy of the tree of life. And so those are the seven blessings of the book of Revelation. And all of those blessings are with Jesus, are all about Jesus. Because the whole book is a revelation of Jesus. It's the worship of Jesus. Remember chapter 5, the scroll that we're looking at was sealed. And John was so sad and depressed, he said, who is worthy to open up this scroll to make known this revelation? And no one was found worthy except one, Jesus Christ. And so the fact that we have this blessing and know these blessings is a result of Jesus Christ being the only one worthy, the worthy one, to give us this revelation, give us this blessing. And so this whole book, whenever you think of Revelation, one of the things you want in your mind is this. It is a book about blessing. And these are the seven blessings for those who know their book. This is the blessing that is given to you. It is complete. And what does it lead us to do? It leads us to worship. But it's the worship of Jesus. Again, John. Man, John misses it. He's so like us. Okay, so let's keep reading. Verse 7, behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of this prophecy of this book. John sees all this blessing, all this marvelous revelation. And he says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book, period. Worship God, period. You see, what John has seen is so marvelous. It's so wonderful that he can't help but worship something. And we talked about this. Worship is worth-ship. It's when we find something so much greater than ourselves that we attribute worth to it. We give it our time, attention, resources. We calendar it in our lives. And we worship many things. And John is so taken back by what has been revealed to him, the blessedness of Revelation, that he has to worship. And he worships the angel, the one who, who gave me this revelation. And the angel is like, stop, stop. I'm a fellow servant with you. Like, we're on the same playing field, man. We both serve someone. Don't worship me. It would be a sin to worship me. Do one thing. Worship God. That's what the whole book's about. Worship God. Remember Revelation 4 and 5? When we got an inside scoop to the throne room of God, what was happening in the throne room? It was worship. The elders were laying down their crowns in worship. They were saying, worthy is the lamb. They were worshiping. The only one worthy to worship with your life is God. And it's a good reminder as we conclude a year and begin a year, that there are many things that are going to want your attention in 2024. They're going to say, worship me. Worship me. Give me your time, your attention, your resources. Calendar me. Create space for me in your life. Identify yourself by me. Worship. And we as Christians say, worship God. That's it. We worship one. Worship God alone. And so John is corrected here in the very last pages. Worship God. I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that will take the book of Revelation and they will worship teachers of this book. 
They will line right up and say, my allegiance is to this teacher of revelation. And it's almost like they worship them. They worship their system. They worship their schematics. They worship all their insights. And the book is correcting even them to say, stop. Stop worshiping teachers of revelation. Worship God. That's what the book's about. Worship God. Nothing else. And so John, again, is directed to worshiping God. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Time is near, coming soon again. Now, this is a, a, a stark contrast to what we have seen as a parallel in the book of Daniel. Daniel, living nearly 700 years prior to this, saw Revelation saw a description of the things of the end of the world, and yet he was told to seal up the prophecy. This is Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 says, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So Daniel, what I have shown you about what God is up to until the very end, you are to seal up and, may, and not let it be known. For the end is not now, is what Daniel was told. John is told just the opposite. I have shown you what God is up to, where this world is going. Do not seal it up. Make sure that it is read. Bless people with it. Make it known witness to these things. And so, do not seal up the words of this prophecy, for the time is near. Time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. It's like the time of Jesus coming is near, and you're going to see these people, as we've divided them in the book of Revelation, those who love evil are going to keep doing evil, and those who love God are continuing to do the things of God. And we all said, the time is near. It's 2,000 years. It doesn't seem like he's that near. Well, the word near here, or coming soon, is not in the sense of chronology of it's happening next. But it means without delay. When it's time to come, it happens without delay. And so what is this last 2,000 years? What is this what we would see as slowness? Well, that's a good question. We've been here before. Let's go there again. 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter says, here's a characteristic of the end of the age. Scoffers will come in the last day with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. Wherever their heart leads them to do, they're just going to do it. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? That's what some of us feel like today. He says, it's near. He's coming soon. Where is that? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. That's what the scoffers say. And then Peter reminds them, for they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and the, through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Like everything is being sustained, upheld for a moment in time without delay that he comes. And Peter says this, do not overlook this one fact. Beloved, that the Lord, right, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. Like, your timetable is not God's timetable. I know that's disappointing for many, but it's true. The Lord is not slow in fulfilling his promises, as some count slowness. So this 2,000 years is not slow as we would count it. But what is it? It is patience towards you, Peter says. That God so loved the world that he has given space and time for the witness of the gospel to go to all the nations. Like, he came into Jerusalem, but he, he wants the Americas to know. He wants China to know. He wants Africa to know. And so he's given space and time for his witnesses to make him known through the whole globe. 
But he is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. And then like John says, the evildoer continues to do evil. Well, what are we to do? Peter says, verse 11, since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be but in lives of holiness and godliness? Peter says, waiting and hastening the coming of the day of, the, of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So what are we to be doing while we're waiting? Just sitting around waiting to go to heaven? No, to be actively busying ourselves in the good works that God has prepared for us. To live lives that are holy and righteous, longing for the Lord's coming. Or to be active as witnesses. In fact, that's what we're called to do. Verse 12 again, behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. When we see this word recompense, we think of like maybe wrath. That's not what it is. It's reward. This is not salvation. This is to reward those who belong to him. I am coming soon to reward the things you have done in Christ. I love that. To repay each one for what he has done. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. There's nothing before or after this Jesus. Blessed are those who wash their robes, as we, as we read, so that they may have the right to the tree of life and they, may ne- and they may enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. But that's not you. No, you belong to the Lord. You have been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. and You belong to him. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things. For the churches. Remember, who was this book addressed to? The seven churches. Jesus pictured himself walking amongst the seven churches. He knew his churches. He loved his churches. This whole testimony was for the church. There wasn't any part of this revelation that was, oh, that's not for the church. doesn't apply to the church. No, this was for you, church. Jesus, I have sent my testimony for the church to know And what was the church called to do? To be a faithful, enduring, truthful, grace-filled witness. In the ways in which they had compromised, they were called to be overcomers. To walk away from the ways in which they had compromised and remain faithful and true to the Lord. And so this whole revelation, Jesus says, is for the churches. He says, I am the root and the descendant of David, which is a hyperlink to Isaiah. One place in Isaiah is 11, chapter 11, verse 1. Where Jesus is promised to come as the root of David. He's he's the offspring of Israel. The promised king to come. And he's the bright morning star. Which is a hyperlink to, to Numbers. Chapter 24. Where there was this crazy pagan prophet named Balaam. And he prophesied that there would come an offspring. A morning star from the tribe of Jacob. Jesus says, that's me. I am the new dawn, the new day coming. The new day that we're longing for is Jesus Christ. And then I love this, verse 17. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears, come. And let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. The invitation is come. I love that it says, the spirit, we know that the spirit of God is witnessing in the world to the things of Jesus Christ. But then here's the church too. Let the spirit and the bride, that means us. What are we to do as we wait for the arrival of Jesus Christ? To continue to invite the world who is thirsty. Let the spirit and the bride, the people of God, tell the world, you're thirsty? You're looking for our identity? You're looking for satisfaction? You're looking for forgiveness? You're looking for renewal? You're looking for health? Come. Come. You don't have any money? Come. 
by water that truly satisfies without price. For Jesus Christ has paid it all. And so what are we to do with our neighbors, our coworkers, our family members who are worn out, beaten down, and do not know Jesus? Let me tell you where springs of living water are. Come. Let me tell you the one who loves you, who satisfies your heart. Come. Let me tell you the one who will give you what you need without price. Come. Who in 2024 will you come alongside and say, let me, let me show you the springs of living water. Come. And drink. Come and drink. And then there's this warning in 18 that people have misappropriated to the whole Bible, but specifically it's to the book of Revelation. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book of the prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. And so that's a warning to preachers. This is what I read before we even started the book, is preach the whole thing. Don't be a coward and skip stuff. Don't be timid and try to change things. Preach the whole thing counsel of God. Let the people know what God has said and let God speak for himself. And so we have. And we come to its conclusion and the conclusion that we get to is, my goodness, who is worthy of worship? Jesus Christ alone. Jesus Christ alone. I hope you leave the book of Revelation with blessing in mind. We go through this book that you might be blessed to know it, to love it, to live it. And when you think of Revelation, think that God has given us what would otherwise not have known for kind of three things. A warning to Christians who have become comfortable, who have compromised, who have wandered, to come back. It's a witness it's a witness to who Jesus Christ is, what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do. And in all of that, it is worship, that we are beings of worship, and we are called to worship God, worship God. And so I can think of no better way than to end our, our series by singing, by worshiping Jesus Christ, the one who has been revealed to us. And so if you're on the worship team, would you come back up? And everyone in the room, let's put our Bibles down. Let's stand. And we will read aloud these final two verses. And then we will worship. Verse 20, let's read together. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. There's no other way to live in 2024 than inside, than out, than inside the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I need so much grace in my life. I know you need grace in your life, and that is where we live, waiting for his coming.